This is a production of Cornell University. Thank you all for being here. My name's Warren Allman. I'm the director of the Paleontological Research Institution across the lake and an adjunct faculty member in Earth and Atmospheric Sciences. And uh, my, it's my privilege to welcome you to the third event in the third year of Ithaca Darwin Day's celebration. Um, this is Ithaca's a uh, homegrown version of the International Darwin Day celebration, which has been sweeping the globe for the last um, eight years, seven years, in preparation for next year, which, of course, is the bicentennial of Darwin's birth. Uh, before we get started with the panel today, uh, a, a few announcements and housekeeping here. First of all, I'd like to thank the sponsors that, whose financial support makes this week of activities possible. Uh, Stephen Lowenthal is a, a Cornell Law School alumnus, uh, class of 1970, and um, his abiding interest in Darwin uh, and, um, and, and all things uh, old, rare, and 19th century um, has been the driving force behind all three years of, of Darwin Day in Ithaca. And Ron Sieber, who is Vice Provost for Land Grant Affairs in Cornell's um, uh, College of Human Ecology, uh, has provided uh, Cornell funding for this. And Tommy Bruce, who is Vice President of Communications for Cornell, has provided support. So without their uh, help, we would not be here today. So we're very grateful for that. I uh, assume you're all here because you've heard about this somehow, and that's great. Um, we really tried to pay special attention this year to the campuses, both uh, Cornell and Ithaca College, to uh, make it available to as many people as possible. Uh, so I remind you uh, of the rest of the events. Uh, tonight, in this room at 7 o'clock, uh, kiss your honey either first or, or either early or late, uh, and then at 7 o'clock, come to uh, uh, a, a lecture by one of the world's great evolutionary biologists, Lynn Margulis from the University of Massachusetts, who will be talking in this room at 7 o'clock. And then her, her first, uh, I'm told, her first talk uh, at Cornell in, in several decades. Uh, and then tomorrow, uh, afternoon is our second panel discussion on genetically modified organisms and evolution, uh, which uh, I'm hoping will be quite provocative. And then on Saturday, if all this seems very dry and academic, uh, all day at the Museum of the Earth across the lake, our family activities for all ages uh, around Darwin and evolution, including live animals from several venues, I am promised. And then Saturday night uh, at 6.30, a free birthday party uh, with cake and all the trimmings uh, uh, for Charles Darwin. So uh, please join us for that. And then Sunday, the last event uh, for this year, is a screening of Master and Commander. If you're a Russell Crowe fan, it's a, it's a regular feature film, but um, it's that rare thing. It is a, a Hollywood feature film with a substantial intellectual subplot to it. It has an evolutionary subplot to it. And so we will be screening that film with, with commentary. Um, the other thing I want to make sure everybody knows is that uh, through the uh, help of the Office of Communications uh, and Publications at Cornell, uh, all the activities uh, for Darwin Days this year are being recorded and transcribed. And uh, by about February 23rd, transcripts of all of this will be available on both Cornell and PRI websites. So if you're interested in finding out more, you can um, get at them uh, very shortly afterwards. Uh, in the back of the room, uh, it would be really great for us if you could, there's a little questionnaire here, if you could just fill this out and just tell us how you heard about this. It really helps us uh, with our, our marketing for next year. Next year is going to be bigger and better, but we want to know how to reach people. Uh, and uh, you don't need an invitation to come on Saturday night to the birthday party, but there are some invitations in the back um, as well to take to your friends. This year's theme for Darwin Days in Ithaca is evolution and environment, very broadly construed. And so in thinking about what uh, we would uh, develop as activities and, and uh, programs for this year, we thought that the, an obvious topic was uh, what is happening to evolution today and what is the near-term prospect for evolution and, and what is the, the human context of all of that. And so we assembled a group of, of panelists to talk about that under the, the very loose topic, are we or how are we affecting evolution? And so let me introduce our, our distinguished panelists up here. Nelson, uh, from, uh, from your left. Um, 
Nelson Hairston is the Frank H. T. Rhodes Professor of Environmental Science uh, in the Department of uh, Ecology and Evolutionary Biology and Senior Associate Dean in the College of Arts and Sciences at Cornell. Lisa Pachuli is Professor of Anthropology at Ithaca College. She's a primatologist and evolutionary biologist. David Winkler is an ornithologist, a curator of the, of the Cornell Bird Collection and professor in ecology and evolutionary biology. And Greg Deedle is director of collections at PRI and an adjunct assistant professor in earth and atmospheric sciences uh, at Cornell. All of them have some interest in, uh, more than some interest in evolutionary biology, and all of them have, uh, uh, have thought about the, the topic of human impacts on evolution, which is why we asked them to be here. Before we get started, I just want to set the stage just a little bit. Um, this is a, a, a topic of, of interest to anybody who's interested in evolution these days. It has to be. Um, uh, are we changing evolution is kind of a rhetorical question. I don't think there's really much question, at least among academic evolutionary biologists, that the answer to that is yes. Uh, but the issue of how and the issue of who cares. Uh, are a little less clear, and I hope that that's what uh, some of the discussion will focus on today. Well, are we changing evolution? Um, uh, if it's so obvious, why is it so obvious? Well, just read the newspaper every day. Uh, climate change, of course, is of concern to lots of people for lots of reasons, but if you're an organism, or if you're an evolutionary biologist that studies organisms, um, most of us are organisms, um, if you're an evolutionary biologist that studies organisms and their response to the environment, then very large, perhaps unprecedented, uh, at least in recent geologic times, change in the environment is important to evolution. So every time you hear about climate change, uh, you're really hearing about the context, uh, the changing context of evolutionary biology. And it's, uh, you hear about poster children like uh, polar bears, uh, but read uh, the finer print or scan some of the more obscure websites and you'll find out that Polar bears are just the, pardon the expression, tip of the iceberg of direct, direct uh, implications of climate change for individual species. Uh, the literature is filled over the last 20 or more years with uh, geographic range changes, habitat uh, alteration, behavior changes that seem to be connected with climate change of various species. And all of that, if it wasn't happening in the context of modern uh, human-mediated activities, we would be calling uh, evolutionary ecology, uh, environmental change leading to evolution. Humans are enormous modifiers of the environment. Now we know that if we think about, uh, if you've ever tried to build anything in Tompkins County, you, you know that you have to go through the planning boards and you have to worry about runoff and so forth. Uh, so we know that in kind of our local sense. But just a couple of factoids about the, the magnitude of human effects on the earth are worth uh, thinking about. Nearly 40% of potential terrestrial net primary productivity, so all the green stuff that grows on land, is now either used directly, co-opted, or doesn't happen because of human activities. And that comes from a paper as long ago as 1986. So 40% of all the, 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 the production of living things on uh, land is somehow going through or being directly affected by human uh, activities. And that's certainly only increased since then. Um, the same group of authors in 1997 wrote that between one third and one half of the land surface of the earth has been transformed significantly by human action. One third and one half of the land surface. More atmospheric nitrogen is fixed by humanity than by all natural terrestrial sources combined. More than half of all accessible surface fresh water is used by humans. And so those are ecologists talking. Um, geologists have been a little late coming to this, but uh, there's some, some really notable uh, uh, publications over the last just couple of years. Um, a paper in 2005 uh, tried to measure current rates of erosion compared to historic rates of erosion over geologic time. And uh, uh, the author concludes, this is Bruce Wilkinson, who was, who was then at the University of Michigan, is now at Syracuse University. He concluded, erosion over the last half billion years of Earth history has lowered continental surfaces by a few tens of meters per million years. 
So natural processes of erosion happen about tens of meters. In comparison, construction and agricultural activities currently result in the transport of enough sediment and rock to lower all ice-free continental surfaces by a few hundred meters per million years. Humans are thus now an order of magnitude more important at moving sediment than the sum of all other natural processes operating on the surface of the planet. And this is not, Wilkinson concludes, a recent development. He looks back at the recent geological record and he concludes that this started, this essentially was established uh, about a thousand years ago. And so we have been, by that metric, a major historic uh, factor of geological land change uh, for a thousand years. And it, again, if we weren't humans, we would be saying, well, that's a major uh, potential evolutionary causation. And most provocatively, just in the last month, an article has come out in a geological magazine saying, uh, actually very seriously proposing that we should stop calling the present geological period the Holocene and call it the Anthropocene. And that isn't because, isn't similar to some earlier suggestions. Julian Huxley, the famous evolutionary biologist in the 1940s, uh, coined the term psychozoic because, uh, you know, humans are different. Um, this is not that same argument. This is to say that geologically we now live in different times. The, the second, so, so we're changing, I don't think there's any debate that we are altering the environment so that that will alter uh, evolutionary uh, processes in some way. But so what? Well, the first so what is, is very selfish. What does this mean for health and human welfare? And um, uh, I probably don't need to, to comment about that extensively. If uh, it isn't just cancer cures we get from uh, tropical rainforests, um, if, we, if we are an evolutionary force that changes the biosphere, uh, we will live in a changed biosphere and uh, have to pay the consequences for that. I'd like to end with a much more problematic question, though, and that is the bigger so what. Um, why should we care uh, if, we're, if we're still here to talk about it and we have uh, our, a comfortable uh, uh, standard of living? Who really cares if we're changing evolution? And actually, uh, by my reading anyway, evolutionary biologists are not unanimous in answering this question. Some of them say, well, you know, the Earth's going to be here after we're gone, and the Earth's been through a lot worse, so no big deal. But there are some uh, 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 environmental ethicists and uh, philosophers who have a different opinion, and that is that uniquely, of course, uh, in biology, we're the only organisms that get to make a choice in what we do. And so we are... Uh, and, and perhaps, they argue, by the, by the ability to make choices, uh, we are encumbered with a responsibility to at least think about those choices. So um, what the context for today is really to talk both about the evolutionary biology of are we changing evolution and how, and to at least initiate the conversation about why should anybody care besides a bunch of evolutionary biologists. So with that, uh, the format is going to be we're going to uh, all give brief statements and then um, uh, they have, a couple of these folks have asked for a chance to go at each other if they want to uh, right afterwards. Um, but then we very much uh, anticipate and encourage questions and answers for the audience as long as people want to stay. So, Nelson. Yeah, I'm a, uh, an evolutionary limnologist, you might say. Limnologists study lakes, and a major portion of my research is about how lakes respond, and organisms in lakes respond evolutionarily to changes in the environment. Uh, it might be uh, predator uh, manipulations, it might be exotic species coming in, uh, nutrient pollution, toxic pollution. Uh, those all expose the organisms in lakes to new uh, environments, and I'm interested in how they respond. Just as an example, some colleagues <coughs> in Germany and I and students from my lab studied Lake Constance, which had had major increase in phosphorus concentrations during the 1960s and 70s. Phosphorus increased the amount of cyanobacteria in the lake, that's blue-green algae. Uh, blue-green algae are known to be toxic to little crustaceans that eat them to contain uh, or to lack a number of essential fatty acids. And so we were interested in how the daphnia, these little crustaceans, respond to this change in their environment. And what we found was that over the course of a decade, 
the animals evolved to be much more efficient at using cyanobacteria in their diet than they had been previously. And we have then indirect evidence even that uh, the, the amount of phytoplankton, the amount of algae in the lake, ultimately responded to this increased efficiency of consumption. So there was a strong evolutionary pressure or environmental change which created a strong pressure which the animals responded to and that ultimately we think cascaded to a change in the way that ecosystem was functioning. This is just one of a great many examples of rapid evolution that are now published in the literature, especially over the last couple decades. The, the peer-reviewed literature has one paper after another about how fast uh, evolution is occurring. And there's two people in particular who've reviewed a lot of this literature, Mike Kinnison at the University of Maine and Andrew Hendry at McGill University. Uh, and they've published a series of review articles summarizing these rates of evolution and comparing them to each other and to geological rates of evolution. Most germane for our discussion is a paper they published last year in the journal uh, Molecular Ecology in which they summarized uh, about 70 different studies from which they could glean 3,000 different rates of evolution and they compared the rates of evolution in systems that had been impacted by human activity, the change was the result of human activity, uh, with systems where the change in the environment seemed to be driven by more natural processes. And what they found was that on average, rates of evolution in human impacted systems were about two to three times those for natural changes. So it's not that evolution is fundamentally different in process uh, when humans impact the environment, but the changes that we impose, as, as Warren nicely summarized, are massive, and so that's a stronger pressure, stronger natural selection, and organisms are responding to those changes. When environmental scientists have studied changes in the environment, they've typically not assumed that the organisms they're studying can evolve in response to that change. So we look at what happens when uh, uh, there's new nutrients added to a lake, what happens when major pollutants come in. We look at how the changes in the, in the community uh, uh, are altered. We look at how the biological processes that those organisms carry out are altered. Uh, when we look at, when we think about conservation issues and how to preserve species uh, that are threatened by um, extinction, we typically have not thought about the fact that those organisms might evolve in response to the threats that are bringing about those uh, potential extinctions. And uh, I think it's time now to consider both of, on both of those fronts, not just how the organisms are evolving, but what the implications of that evolution are for uh, ultimately how environmental change um, will take place, what the end point of environmental change will be that the organisms alter that change while it's happening, or that the potential for preserving species uh, by conservation efforts needs to track not just what the abundances are and what the capabilities of the organisms are now, but what the capabilities of those organisms will be in the future. I just had a paper last year come out with Mike Kinnison, which we titled Eco-Evolutionary Conservation Biology, in which we addressed this kind of question, what the considerations would be as a population is perhaps headed toward extinction, what do the rates of evolution need to be uh, to rescue that species from extinction? Uh, but what does that evolution actually mean? Is it really the same organism that we're now rescuing? I'll stop there. The question, are we changing evolution, I think for many of us is a question of are we changing the selection pressures affecting organisms organisms today and are we affecting which genes get into the next gene pool, into the next generation. Um, from my own work, I'm a primatologist, I study monkeys and apes, lemurs, monkeys and apes, and right, um, more recently, monkeys and apes on some remote islands off of Sumatra, they're called the Mentawai Islands, and I've seen how human interaction and involvement with the environment has affected many of the plant and animal species living in the rainforest in which I work. One example is I looked at habitats that were unaffected by humans, so let's say rainforests that were unlogged, and then forests that were logged 10 years ago and forests that were logged 20 years ago. And what we did is we went through the forest and we just took some surveys of how many primates we detected in the area. And what we found, I thought I'd go in there and find that you know, all of the primate densities would be lower in the logged forest, but of course 
reality is never that simple. What we found is that for some species, their densities actually were high, well, one species, the densities was actually higher in logged forests. For one of the spe four species, the densities were lower. And for two of them, the densities seemed unaffected, regardless of which type of forest they were in, the densities were not significantly different. And so this caused me to look at, as humans are interacting with the environment, are we changing evolution for all of the species or possibly just some of them? So for some of them, we can look at differences between populations and see which ones have higher densities and for various reasons how they're responding to this selective pressure of logging. Another example is uh, we studied hunting, and we looked at areas in which there was heavy primate hunting, no primate hunting, and moderate primate hunting. And again, we found that certain species were selected for, so you can see humans exerting a selection pressure. So for some species, we found that their densities were much lower in, logged, uh, sorry, in hunted forests, and others were not. Within species, if we're talking about which genes and alleles are getting into the next generation, within a single species that was hunted heavily, and even across species, we could see that, for example, females, and in particular females with offspring that were, either, that were on them, were targeted more heavily than males. And this can affect the population drastically. And in fact, you need breeding females, right, to keep the population going. So when we talk about extinction processes, you can think of it in, in sort of, sort of a two-step process that the population becomes small, and then what happens to it once it's very small. Um, a plant example I've seen is uh, some of the local people, at some point it became popular to take a particular species of tree because a substance was extracted from it and used to make mosquito coils and insect repellent. And so this tree that really wasn't very important to anyone prior to this uh, mandate to collect these trees and the bark off of them, you know, just survived, I'd say, at a density possibly of, uh, it's a low density because we're in the rainforest, maybe three per kilometer squared. Um, and then afterward, I could go through forests uh, and, and walk for a, a half a day and not find any of these tree species. So how does that affect not only that species, but we talk about a cascading effect. How does it affect all the other insects and organisms that depend on it and the other tree species in the area? With humans, in terms of, uh, in human populations, looking at allele changes from one generation to the next. For those of us who travel, I'm, I'm sure you've seen this phenomenon. I was in a, uh, Madagascar a while back, and I was invited to a circumcision ritual. And so I had to travel, walk for about a half a day to get to this village in time for this big ritual. And I was, you know, again, a half a day walk away from the village that was closest to the forest I was working in. And I saw people there who I didn't know, but I looked at them and I said, my gosh, you look so much like our guide X. And in fact, they told me they were related to guide X. And I saw someone else and said, you look exactly like guide B. And they told me that, uh, in fact, they were related distantly. But I, I could look at a person and literally tell their ancestry and where people were from. In contrast, so there we might say there's very uh, minimal genetic variation. In contrast to that, I just returned from Iceland and um, was in a restaurant eating Thai food, and I thought the food was great, and I started talking with someone from the university who mentioned to me, I, I commented that I thought it was great there was such good Thai food someplace so far from Thailand, and they mentioned to me there's this phenomenon going on right now. Of course, it's not for every Icelandic person, but in certain communities that people, in particular men, are becoming aware that there's very low diversity in this extreme northern environment that's cold and far away from, you know, you need to get on a plane to get there, and that it's become popular in certain circles, uh, and for men in particular, to order, let's say, a mail order bride or get online and meet someone in particular from Thailand right now. So the population of Thais is increasing, and we're seeing a, a change in human variation there. The genetic diversity of the Icelandic population is changing over time, and as more and more Thai women are brought into the culture, and people from Southeast Asia will see a change over time, again, in the population at large. So I think um, that those are examples uh, from the plant uh, studies and uh, some plant observations I've made from mammals and human observations. But I think we can broaden this topic. Uh, Warren mentioned before uh, that there'll be talks tomorrow, I think, on genetically modified organisms. Um, releasing GMOs into our food supply, how does that affect the genes that are in the population and what will be prevalent in the future? Also, uh, germ warfare, eradicating smallpox and polio, organisms that typically need their hosts to be alive and sometimes jump to uh, a whole different type of set of uh, hosts or organisms. 
uh, what about runoff from insecticides and herbicides that end up uh, flushing endocrine disruptors in rivulets and streams? How is that affecting the myriad of organisms, including, including humans, who use those uh, waterways? Spreading radioactivity, um, having a little less carbon in the atmosphere, right? Some people think warming the climate three to nine degrees uh, isn't a lot, but uh, Warren mentioned how we can see the effects of this. Uh, what about some human policies, like in China, the one child, the one male policy? That obviously is affecting what genes are legally allowed to be in the population right now, or the, the numbers of them, the frequency of them, and what will affect future generations. Um, and then we have uh, some researchers who are participating in studies that actually transfer genes, not just... Uh, let's say, across closely related species, but we know that people now can transfer genes from one kingdom to another. So all of these are ways that we see that uh, evolution is changing, or the speed, or the rate, or at least the selective pressures on organisms, which affect which alleles and, and or genes get into the next population. Uh, I look at uh, evolution and ecology and the environment with three different hats. The first hat is as a scientist. I study life history traits of birds. Life history traits are those aspects of the phenotype which are most directly connected either to reproduction or survival. So they're really the core um, things that relate to whether or not that species is going to succeed. Um, that if we look at life history traits and we compare life history traits, say, in vertebrates like birds or, say, insects, um, those two kinds of organisms are very different kinds of organisms. And we expect vertebrates to have a lot more built-in machinery to deal with environmental change than insects. We think of insects as dealing with environmental change by being selected. Um, through their very rapid generation time to respond quickly to environmental change, whereas vertebrates, especially birds, often take their time. And if we want to study how flexible their traits are, we have to do experiments to see how they respond to environmental change. So from a scientist's perspective, climate change for me is very interesting because the birds I study, tree swallows and their kin, are extremely sensitive to weather. And what better way to look at how flexible their life histories are than to change the weather, change the climate, and see how the birds are responding. So as a scientist, I find it very interesting, uh, and that's what we do. We basically study the evolved part of the birds' phenotypes by looking at what doesn't change in response to climate change. Because what responds to climate change, we're pretty sure, is not, is not evolved change right now, but it's rather the expression of inbuilt phenotypic abilities to make different decisions in different environments with their reproductive physiology. If they can't change in, on the order of 10 years, um, then it's probably something that's going to require evolutionary change. So that's sort of studying evolution by subtraction, looking at what doesn't respond to climate change. Now, if I instead wear my hat as an environmentalist and say, well, what are the implications of climate change for birds and insects, that contrast between birds and insects becomes very important. And we, I have colleagues in Europe who have, who have studied a bird that is very definitely mismatched to its insect prey in the response to climate change. And that scientist is very concerned about the welfare of these bird populations because the birds migrate to Africa and back every year. They come back every spring um, on a schedule that they've inherited from their ancestors because from Africa they can't make a forecast, a very good forecast of what the environmental conditions are going to be like in northern Europe. So when they take off on their mi northward migration in the spring, they're taking off on a calendar that they inherited from their ancestors. Unfortunately, the insects that, uh, that they go there to eat in the breeding grounds uh, and to feed their young, those insects are responding much more rapidly to environmental change. So they are moving very rapidly in response to natural selection in a way that the birds cannot move as rapidly. And we get this really interesting but unfortunate mismatch in the timing of the birds' reproduction and the emergence of the insect prey on which they, um, on which they rely. So that's one example of how, as an environmentalist studying birds and insects, 
we can see how the really different organisms have very different responses and leads to real co conservation concerns for the birds. Finally, I'd have to say that talking about the, res the uh, interaction between evolution and, um, and uh, the environment right now with my hat on as a citizen and addressing the notion of uh, whether there's an ethical um, debate here, um, I would just uh, offer the kind of evolutionary perspective that it hasn't been since the Precambrian that any one species or group of species has been having such an effect on the environment. And in the Precambrian, we had these wonderful um, uh, communities of microorganisms that basically created the oxygen in the atmosphere that we're breathing today. And not since then have we had biology affecting the earth so dramatically. So I absolutely love this idea of calling this the Anthropocene. It makes abundant sense to me. Um, and, it, and also, it helps me with the ethical issue. I'd say, any, if it hasn't happened in 300 million years, it's probably time for us to think seriously about moderating our behavior. Having been, been trained as a paleontologist, um, naturally, I, th I want to look to the past for, for clues to understand how we might be changing future evolution. I think everybody here today would agree that uh, effective conservation practices should seek to, to conserve the evolutionary processes that uh, maintain and generate uh, the diversity of life. A good place to start, I think, is by asking a question. And I want to know what environmental factors are conducive to adaptation. Another way of stating this is when and under what circumstances are new traits evolved or are existing ones modified. I think the fossil record, although by no means perfect, provides an opportunity and, and actually a largely untapped resource to addressing this question. The fossil record preserves many species interactions, for instance, that have evolved for thousands if not millions of years. Each of these interactions has resulted from natural selection under every imaginable circumstance and carries information on what adaptive solutions work best in a particular kind of environment. In addition, given the global reach of human interactions with the environment today, the fossil record may be the only place we have left to really study the long-term outcomes of evolving species interactions, particularly during times of major disturbance. So now some lessons from the past. Data from the fossil record suggests that adaptive innovations that require or entail a high investment of energy are most likely to evolve in what can best be described as a permissive environment in which, one, the availability of resources is high and predictable, such that energetic constraints on functional improvement are low, and two, competition in, in the broadest sense of the word is intense. Of course, this is where the bar of performance itself is set high. Gary Vermey, a paleontologist at the University of California at Davis, who visited PRI and Cornell not so long ago, continues to be probably the, the main proponent of these ideas. Adaptation in this view um, is very much an episodic process. With these circumstances in mind, in my view, a major problem humanity faces is that we are increasingly creating conditions that decrease evolutionary potential. For example, we know that habitat loss and fragmentation are often associated with reductions in population size as well as isolation of populations, conditions that can impede the adaptive uh, responses of organisms. Importantly, these changes also reduce the productive capacity of the systems in which these species are embedded within. Another example related to my second point on competition is that hunting and fishing practices have also eliminated top consumers worldwide or depressed their numbers to the point where these animals no longer fulfill their ecological roles, let alone their evolutionary roles. If the permissiveness hypothesis that I briefly outlined earlier is correct, our actions and those others that Warren mentioned may be severely limiting the capacity of most species to adapt to in novel ways to changes in their environments. In addition, at a much larger scale, the ongoing wholesale destruction of the tropics may be, as some have said, permanently depleting what 
what we would call evolutionary powerhouses or evolutionary engines of the planet. These are essentially sources of, of major novelties. These concerns remain little more than speculation at the moment. I hope, however, that with continued efforts to understand the circumstances that nurture adaptation, we can replace it with a more empirically grounded scenario for the future of evolutionary adaptation. In closing, given that a failure to adapt poses a threat to the persistence of species, and some would even go as far as to say a situation that is at least as grave as extinction itself, a deeper understanding of the circumstances permitting adaptation is critical for revising policies governing how we as a society interact with the species and ecosystems in our biosphere, which, as we all know, we are dependent upon for our own survival. Thank you. Wow. That's quite a spread. Um, so uh, I guess I'll give all of you first shot. Does anybody want to say uh, anything to each other before we open it to questions or ask each other any questions? Uh, the panelists, how do we uh, respond to, let me play devil's advocate, to people who say climate change, you know, we went through an ice age, we went through many ice ages, including one about 10, 14,000 years ago, um, and that would exert a significant selective pressure on the human ancestors that were around at that point, as well as all the other organisms, or when we talk about speeding up uh, or changing evolution, what about... 65 million years ago, a meteor hitting the planet. So how do you respond to your students or colleagues or people in the public who sort of throw this at you and want a response? Good question. <laughs> who wants to take it first? Go well, for it, Wendt. I, I always point out that the, it, um, not like the, the asteroid example, but relative to other examples of, of uh, change, environmental change, <laughs> We are imposing a change that's way more rapid than any or the great majority of ones we know from the fossil record. Um, and that that's going to stretch the abilities of especially these lower, longer generation time organisms. It's going to stretch their abilities to respond. And especially for those of us who work on terrestrial organisms, all of whom depend ultimately on plant distributions, if the plant communities cannot keep up with changing climate bands across the earth, then the animals are going to have no homes. So um, it's just a matter of scale, both in time and, uh, and, and the global nature of the impact, that this really is qualitatively um, uh, at the scale of the asteroid impacts. Um, and uh, as Warren said, we have the ability to do something about it. We don't for asteroids. Mm -hmm. Having the ability to do something about it is, is the key because I don't know what hominids thought when the glaciers came down, but they couldn't do anything about it. They didn't cause it. They simply responded, and I suspect some of them didn't like what was happening. But uh, we're the ones causing these changes. We see them happening. We can see how they're influencing us, and we should do something about it. I have uh, something to comment on something Wink uh, had said, and that is your comment related to the Cretaceous extinctions versus um, today, and today is more rapid um, and unprecedented in a sense. We should think about what, what species are actually becoming extinct. Um, I was reading a paper by David Jablonski from the University of Chicago, and he mentions in that paper that the Cretaceous extinctions, we lost about 85% of all genera, in the oceans at least. Um, we are nowhere near that yet today. So right. fundamentally, right. there are some differences. Doesn't mean we're necessarily going to not get to that point. Right. But we need to think uh, about making, you know, not comparing apples and oranges to some degree. Mm -hmm. No more uh, cheap shots. <laughs> okay. Well, the audience is encouraged to uh, agree, disagree, ask questions, etc. Until you don't want to anymore. Um, so, as you. All right, and species to have, uh, cohabit with us. I was just wondering what, in terms of specialty, specialization for species, like you know there's the lice that only lives on humans. Is there any other movement in that direction for species such as ants, roaches, uh, raccoons, rats? 
who just specialize in the human environment? I can give you uh, a, just a simple example with primates. One of the uh, monkeys called the macaque, it's your general monkey, seems to do very well around humans. And I think there are certain reasons for this. And I think one of the ideas Greg was getting to is the ability of, or talking about adaptations, the ability of organisms to adapt. So we talk about flexibility or plasticity. And uh, these macaques seem to do very well in areas where there are humans, and there are several reasons. So if I go in an area that's logged, and I'm actually recording something simple like the number of tractor trails from logging trucks or human trails, there are always more macaques there. Um, if I'm in an area that has uh, been converted, fo- rainforest converted to farmland, the density of macaques is higher. And what we find is that macaques are just a very adaptable species. And they, as you mentioned, humans are moving across the globe and we're creating new environments. So what about the organisms that are inhabiting these environments? Where I do my research, out of the four species, we have one primarily that is inhabiting these areas. And we see that they have certain traits. And some of the, they don't have a very, they're not very specialized. We call them more generalist. So for example, they, I can find a macaque from zero meters, so on the ground, all the way up to the tippy tops of trees, um, whereas other species are completely arboreal and spend time in the, the highest part of the trees, and others spend most of their time on the ground. I sometimes even see them, they forage on, if I look at their diet, it's not just fruits, and if there are no fruits, they don't do well. They're very general. They'll even go into a stream and look for little fish or crayfish. Um, so we, when we talk about uh, adaptations and how adaptable, let's say, species are. I think we look about we look at uh, specialists versus generalists is one way to look at it. So this one particular species happens to be doing better uh, where there are humans. And I think one of the things we look at is what's going on with the other species. And if it's just one out of four, or one out of ten, or one out of twenty-five, then what can we do? And I think there might be examples uh, that other people have studied as well. One of the fascinating things when you study birds is that. When you get off the airplane in a new continent, you're expecting to see all kinds of new birds. You've been studying your field guide, but it's usually not until the next day that you start seeing new birds because the bird fauna in every city in the world is very similar. Um, So we don't just move into new environments and create new environments on our own. We bring all kinds of stuff with us. And it's not just the lice, but we bring birds into our environments and um, it's not always exactly the same species, but it's all species that have the properties that Lisa says. And those, those generalist species, or even those species that just have some w- weird aspect in their behavior, they don't mind being around big bipedal primates, that those species thrive and almost everything else does not. And so we're creating this wonderful schmear. It's like the McDonaldization of the bird faunas of the world. Uh, we're getting the same fauna everywhere. And I often sit back and think, well, what are the, what are the, um, the biogeographers from Alpha Centauri going to think when they visit here in a million years? And they wonder, what the heck happened to biogeography? Because it just all of a sudden they had all these patterns in the fossil record and they just disappeared when these humans got common. Because we're, we're homogenizing the environments around the world. Do you think it, um, you know, the generalists like the raccoons and the, the macaques can respond quickest? Do you, do you think as time goes on and as the human environment stabilizes, we'll, we will get some real specialists in the human environment? Well, we have specialists in, in disease organisms. And that's a place where we're really changing the environment, substantially changing the distribution of vectors so that diseases are spreading northward as, as environments warm and up mountains as environments warm. And that's a, m- a major effect that we're having on specialist organisms and their distributions. We should point out that, that this panel is certainly not the only people that have ever talked about this topic. There are a number of books out there with varying titles like The End of Evolution and, and The Sixth Extinction and so forth that, that talk about this. And, and it, they range the gamut from saying that um, there are almost no top predators in many ecosystems anymore, uh, marine and terrestrial, to uh, uh, comments about, say, the deer in Cuga Heights, um, which we've obviously changed the biology of considerably. Um, so, uh, you know, and 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 jokes about the world filled with cockroaches and, and rats, um, a, a, 
a kind of semi-comical book that came out a few years ago um, called uh, Life After Man, or After Man, by Dougal Dixon, talked about evolution 50 million years from now. And it took reasonable assumptions like there won't be any whales because we will have killed them and, and so forth. And so it said, well, penguins might turn into whales and rats are going to turn into top carnivores. Um, that was slightly fanciful, but, but the, I think those are the kinds of changes we're making now. And you can look back in the fossil record and see many of those kinds of changes where you presumably got rid of specialists for a variety of reasons in a particular habitat. Generalists reigned for a little while until you got new specialists. But the, uh, there was one interesting premise of your question, and that is that human uh, populations and environments are going to stabilize. Mm. I see precious little hope of that. And if, if they were, then it would be very interesting to think about if the other biota would evolve, other than microorganisms would evolve with humans. But uh, th that premise is one I would really love to see happen, but I, I don't think, I don't, I don't see much hope for it. Yeah, well, I was just imagining, you know, London's been around since, you know, the uh, middle centuries, so, you know, at least you have human environments stabilizing. Any, any uh, next question? There was somebody had. Oh, Greg, go ahead. Um, this one comment about Dixon's book, he had one other assumption in it, and that was that uh, humans became extinct. That's true, right. That's right. Right? Yes, sir. Yes. Uh, I want to uh, ask Dr. Winkler, please. Uh, many, many years ago when I was young, I, I was a Boy Scout and I was an ornithologist, and I haven't looked at a bird. Uh, except to feed the ones in my backyard for 40 years, maybe. And not long ago, uh, last summer, uh, I, I was out in a field, and there was a waterfall near there, and I saw a swift fly in and through the waterfall and out, and then it flew through the waterfall again. And I don't know if that was an anomaly, or if that's the beginning of a change, or it's a change is going on. Can you explain that to me? Well, that swift presumably would be a chimney swift, and um, that's our common swift here locally. They're not famous for going into waterfalls, but there are lots of swifts in the same family that are closely related that do. So it's not a big jump. Uh, well, it may have been an anomaly for that species in this population, but I, there's not a there's not a big tradition of swifts going into waterfalls in the Northeast, but certainly throughout the rest of the world, there are many swift species that go right through waterfalls. Okay. In the back. Um, thinking about the changes in agriculture over the past hundred years, just say like, and actually like the last fifty years, moving to like huge farms and monocropping. What are your thoughts about the future for agriculture, as like from an evolution stance? What do you think is going to happen? Hmm. Come to the panel tomorrow. <laughs> well, I, I'll just say one thing, and that is uh, it worries me like crazy what Monsanto is doing to the patterns of agriculture across the world. Um, I think that it's going to be a real miracle if we emerge from the next couple of decades still eating soybeans because we have one genotype out there, uh, and that's not a good situation. And just to give a historical uh, perspective, humans have been performing uh, some sorts of agriculture for about 12 to 14,000 years. And uh, a paper I read uh, just before I came over here today, or glanced at the abstract, I thought had a really neat title. It was called GMO, colon, Evolution Under Control or Frankengene Technology, that even people who are well-versed um, in this discipline are becoming very concerned uh, because it is a big biotech field and there's a lot of money to be made. And we've all heard about certain crops, uh, rice that's been enhanced that helps uh, certain populations in Asia get nutrients and vitamins that they wouldn't otherwise. Uh, but we've also seen examples of how difficult it is to control pollination and then what happens once uh, those genes are outside of that isolated population. And there you're talking about immediately not even changing allele frequencies from one generation to the next, but the current right generation. So immediately changing. And I think it's something that you were getting at, this rapidity of change that we didn't always see in the past. 
Another question. Yes, ma'am, in the back. Um, so the discussion today has mostly been focused on how human activities are influencing evolution around us, but do you have any opinions or thoughts on how human activities are influencing the evolution of humans? I think this is you. One of the things I mentioned earlier um, is that if we look at uh, more traditional populations that for socioeconomic reasons or cultural reasons, reasons don't have access to, say, uh, different modes of transportation, and in some parts of the world in which I work, uh, people, uh, we talk about exogamy and endogamy marrying within the culture or, or within a certain group and exogamy marrying outside. And what I see as I travel around the world, and I'm sure many of you have seen this, is that in some populations there's very little genetic variation, that you could almost do a pedigree of who's related to who just by looking at people, as opposed to other populations, and in particular uh, large cities, uh, in particular in Europe and the U.S., where you can't tell who's related to who. And if we look at human evolution and say that it's been going on for about 7 million years, there are these interesting patterns that we see in for example, up until about 1.8 million years ago, um, we don't have good evidence of humans being out of Africa. But then with Homo erectus moving out of Africa, and when you're moving out of Africa, you're bringing right, your genes, your genetic history with you. So there are people who look at migration patterns um, and can see where do we have our oldest common ancestor back to 5 to 7 million years ago or back to about 100 to 200,000 years ago in, for Homo sapiens. Um, and once you have what happened, if you look at the population as a whole in terms of evolution, there were certain pop populations that were up in northwest Africa. And it makes sense that it was those populations about 200,000 years ago that then moved out of Africa and then populated the rest of the world. So it's a really interesting pattern that we have a lot of gen genetic variation on the continent of Africa, and a lot of that didn't get out. So if you can picture northwest Africa and only a small population getting out and then populating the rest of the world. And if we go back, this is only about, let's say, 200,000 years ago, we can trace our ancestry to East and or South Africa. But the, so the interesting question is, what are we doing to the process of evolution? What are we doing to natural selection? Which is how the amazing diversity of life on Earth came to be. Um, that's a really good question. It's a question full of all kinds of ethical problems. Uh, I mean, we all, a lot of us wear eyeglasses, and a lot of us uh, have all kinds of things that we are here, and part of the, the uh, reprodu reproducing pool of humans uh, that we're only here because of modern medicine, a cultural sort of acquisition, which we didn't evolve. Um, and then that raises all kinds of great questions. Well, do we still abide by natural selection? Or are we still affected by natural selection? I personally feel like eventually we will be. Uh, our population will reach limits that no amount of medicine or technology will help us with. But uh, right now, I'd say it's fair to say that we're under different selective regime than there's a mismatch between what we're doing now and and uh, basically the fact that I think we are very little different from Cro-Magnon, and uh, we're we're basically cavemen living in you know, um, a modern you know we're the Jetsons that are living with Fred Flintstone's uh, body, and so we haven't caught up, and we're not going to catch up. Uh, I reckon. Last year, our, our theme was on evolution and human nature, and one of our panel discussions was on uh, eugenics, and which was a direct outcome of, which is human selective breeding and human, the control of human evolution, if you will, and that eugenics, uh, which uh, everybody now roundly um, criticizes, was a direct outgrowth of, of discussing exactly these issues less than a century ago. In the back, yes. Uh, this is in response to um, what Dr. Winkler was saying. Um, my question was, couldn't it be argued that in the same way that primates have evolved uh, their use of tools, for example, in, in catching insects, that our medical practices and our technological advances are also just another, um, uh, I guess, evolutionary advantage? 
evolutionary advantage, they're not an evolved advantage. That's the distinction I would make. Um, but, but who's to say that they're not natural? Or that, I mean, there's another big ethical problem here, and that is where or do we draw a line between humans and the rest of, of uh, living things? Um, and depending on how you decide on that, you have different um, judgments that you'll make. So yeah, I'm, please don't get me wrong. I'm not advocating eugenics, and I'm not advocating, um, you know, suspending medical research or not doing everything we can to take care of everybody on this earth. But um, all I'm saying is that that has an effect on the way that the evolutionary process affects this species. Just, just as a, an ape using a, a twig to get insects out of a log has altered the selection pressure on how it's getting food because it now has a different way of doing it. All of the things that we do to maintain ourselves alter selection on us. We're not as physically fit, and there's probably not very strong selection to be as physically fit as there was when you had to walk miles to get where you wanted to go. Or run away from the line. <laughs> <laughs> Other questions? Yes, sir. As organisms evolve, like in response to the human presence, do you think we'll start seeing more species become like important parts of society, like how bees are important for pollination, things like that? You think there'll be a focus on like fitting into human existence? Yeah, they'll be gone as as we dominate the earth. So, to the extent that we drive that evolution, those that those that can adapt will, and those that can't will be gone. It has to be. I mean, there's, there's a really interesting possibility that sort of suggested by Lisa's mention of this GMO article. Uh, the, the other shoe hasn't really dropped on, on uh, genetic engineering. I mean, we're mostly engineering plants right now. Um, there's lots of possibility for engineering animals, too. and. Uh, who knows what that'll bring? Um, you know, you might all have, we all might all have a goat in our living room that's that's uh, shooting out silk sometime. I don't know, but uh, those are anything that we are. It's just like medicine. Anything that we create through genetic modification is going to become part of our lives, and if it's a living thing, that's that's the technology. It's going to be really hard to draw the line because those those creations are going to be subject to human selection. At the same time, if they have any kind of independent life from us, they're going to be subject to natural selection. So it's going to be very interesting. Yeah. We tried but uh, couldn't get uh, somebody to participate in this panel who would uh, talk about invasive organisms, um, which is a whole other aspect of this. Introducing organisms where they weren't before we introduced them is uh, another aspect of this. And so we do experiments like that all the time, right? That you can introduce parrots into Miami and, and uh, that, didn't, that didn't live there, and now they do. Um, and you can introduce starlings into Central Park, and they didn't live there, and now they do. Um, and uh, that's, a, that's a, an enormous realm of evolutionary change. Other questions? Is there somebody who had a hand up? Sorry for that, but I was wondering, you just, um, uh, was, you were just talking about that we are selected for generalists, and um, I was wondering, isn't, uh, aren't generalists just um, uh, more fit animals, and are, uh, are we just uh, selected for the fittest animals? Well, it depends on the selection pressure, because, uh, Generalists do best in conditions where the environment is variable, but if the environment stays constant in a particular way, then a specialist will do better than a generalist because it's very good at that particular thing that it's doing. So it, it, it's, it depends on what we're doing to the, to the environment, whether we will be selecting for generalists uh, or specialists, but to the extent that we're homogenizing the world by moving everything around, by cutting everything down, uh, we are probably making the world more even and therefore selecting for organisms or giving advantage to organisms that are more generalist. But uh, 
that's real speculation at this point, I think. And to add to that, one really important concept to remember, and I find that students often have trouble with this, is that fitness is a relative term that changes with depending on what the environmental demands are, if there are any. So that, um, you know, if we all went to the North Pole and we're standing there just dressed as we are, some of us would be more fit. Some of us would remain standing, whereas others of us would fall off. And then if we took that same population um, and went and stood on the equator, some of us would be standing longer than others. So depending on the environment, even in one location, um, we just need to remember that fitness is a relative term. So it's not like the biggest, the baddest, the fastest is always the best. It depends on if there's selection pressures and what those pressures are, who or what organisms are the fittest. And even then, there's no natural way of judging um, the, the relative fitness of species. We can do relative fitness within species easily, but it's really hard to compare um, a blue whale and the, and the copepod that's parasitizing it. I mean, is one a better organism or better evolved? Or uh, They're both here. They're a success story. Um, and that's about all we can say. But we know that anything that's here has left 99.999% of its ancestral um, stock behind it. And uh, so the survivors are all pretty darn good at what they do. One of my colleagues is a, a theoretician, and this is Steve Elner, for those who know him. His, his sort of starting point question for lots of uh, issues like this is, why isn't the world covered in green slime? So, because that ought to be the best at everything. Uh, and one of the major challenges in biology and, and the joys of doing biology is, is figuring out why we have this huge diversity. Why isn't there one organism that's simply better at covering the earth than everything else? And we spend a lot of time, we have a lot of hypotheses, we have a lot of data that helps us understand that, but it's a huge challenge to understand that diversity. What we're doing to those processes that create that diversity is, is intriguing. <laughs> now, if we could photosynthesize, we would be, for sure. So the evidence is building that the only hope for plants and animals is the elimination of man. <laughs> we are now. Yeah. And women, I'm afraid. <laughs> I think it's just the men. <laughs> Any parting shots? I remind everybody that um, these transcripts will be... Um, edited uh, by our panelists, will be um, uh, available on the web um, in about 10 days. And uh, we will, we're happy that the third, the third Darwin at Cornell volume uh, in hard copy for you old-fashioned people will be uh, out within the next uh, month or so. I was just at the bookstore uh, on campus uh, a couple of days ago, and both previous editions are there on the, on the local interest shelf. So. Um, We've raised a bunch of issues that refer back to other Darwin Day panels. Um, that's the whole idea, for this to be a, an ongoing conversation. Um, one more question? Yeah. Um, I, before we go, I want to go to yours, but I wanted to not let Howie's uh, um, his, um, you can edit summary, you can his, uh, no, I, I, his summary judgment shouldn't go unanswered. That, Go I mean, I've been, I've been talking very dismally about the future of humans and with it the biota of the earth. But we are, we do have the ability to do otherwise. And um, at some point, our brains might actually kick into action and uh, regulate uh, what we do about reproduction. I don't see any real big hope, but uh, we still could do it. And if we're going to do it, it's going to have to be done starting in places like this. So it's darn sure that it's not going to happen unless we see what has to happen and try to motivate that to happen. Uh, I'd like my kids to be able to think that things were looking up um, and it's not looking good unless we all start doing that. So I, I've been talking dismally, but I don't think we're without hope. And if, if we don't do it, nobody's going to. Well said. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm just uh, wondering what environments are the least changed by uh, human impact and which ones have we changed the most? I think where we have really low population densities of humans. 
So in certain desert regions, not to say that desert deserts are not go- undergoing change, but at least not um, as direct as we would see, for example, in rainforest environments where there's a product there that people want. I don't think that some of the desert sand is in high demand, fortunately, um, but trees, for example, and everything else that comes along with that. And I don't know if anyone else has anything to add. Um, I got a few things on that. Uh, I'm, I'm hearing this, I'm reminded of Jeremy Jackson's uh, comment that there's, there's n- no such thing as a pristine environment left that hasn't been touched by humans. Um, okay, granted, a, a desert, maybe not as much change. Um, really, the only way we're ever going to get at finding out what these baseline environments look like before humans were here was to start looking at the historical past. And that's one reason why we, paleo, I guess, is, is really um, going to, in the future, be an important component of conservation in general. I'm glad you brought that up, Greg, because um, I'd meant to mention Jeremy's comment that it's one of the most provocative things to me. Um, maybe it's commonplace among biology students now, I, I hope so. Just think, if it isn't, if you've never heard this before, go away and think about this. While you're thinking of Wink's optimism, also think about this, that there is no environment anywhere on Earth that is in its pre-human condition. Not one single environment, probably. Yes, ma'am. And I would wind up with Wink's famous uh, aphorism that uh, things being as they are, we're all gardeners now. Things being as they are, we're all gardeners now. On that note, (laughs) come back at 7 o'clock for Lynn Margulis, this time, this place. Thank you all for being here.